The Knowledge of Self From the Alchemy of Happiness by Al-Ghazali Chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Knowledge of self is the key to the knowledge of God. According to the saying, he who knows himself knows God, and, as it is written in the Koran, we will show them our signs in the world and in themselves, that the truth may be manifest to them. Now nothing is nearer to thee than thyself, and if thou knowest not thyself, how canst thou know anything else? If thou sayest, I know myself, meaning thy outward shape, body, face, limbs, and so forth, such knowledge can never be a key to the knowledge of God, nor, if thy knowledge as to that which is within only extends so far, that when thou art hungry thou eatest, and when thou art angry thou attackest someone, wilt thou progress any further in this path, for the beasts are thy partners in this. But real self-knowledge consists in knowing the following things. What art thou in thyself? and from whence hast thou come? Whither art thou going, and for what purpose hast thou come to tarry here a while, and in what does thy real happiness and misery consist? Some of thy attributes are those of animals, some of devils, some of angels, and thou hast to find out which of these attributes are accidental and which essential. Till thou knowest this, thou canst not find out where thy real happiness lies. The occupation of animals is eating, sleeping, and fighting. Therefore, if thou art an animal, busy thyself in these things. Devils are busy stirring up mischief, and in guile and deceit. If thou belongest to them, do their work. Angels contemplate the beauty of God, and are entirely free from animal qualities. If thou art of angelic nature, then strive toward thine origin, that thou mayest know and contemplate the Most High, and be delivered from the thraldom to lust and anger. Thou shouldest also discover why thou hast been created with these two animal instincts, whether that they should subdue and lead thee captive, or whether thou shouldest subdue them, and in thy upward progress make of one thy steed, and of the other thy weapon. The first step to self-knowledge is to know that thou art composed of an outward shape called the body and an inward entity called the heart or soul. By heart, I do not mean the piece of flesh situated in the left of our bodies, but that which uses all the other faculties as its instruments and servants. In truth, it does not belong to the visible world, but to the invisible and has come into this world as a traveler visits a foreign country for the sake of merchandise, and will presently return to its native land. It is the knowledge of this entity and its attributes which is the key to the knowledge of God. Some idea of the reality of the heart or spirit may be obtained by a man closing his eyes and forgetting everything around except his individuality. He will thus also obtain a glimpse of the unending nature of that individuality. Too close inquiry, however, into the essence of spirit is forbidden by the law. In the Koran it is written, They will question thee concerning the spirit. Say, The spirit comes by the command of my Lord. Thus much is known of it, that it is an indivisible essence belonging to the world of decrees and that it is not from everlasting, but created. An exact philosophical knowledge of the spirit is not a necessary preliminary to walking in the path of religion, but comes rather as a result of self-discipline and perseverance in that path, as it is said in the Koran, Those who strive in our way, verily we will guide them to the right paths. For the carrying on of this spiritual warfare by which the knowledge of oneself and of God is to be obtained, the body may be figured as a kingdom, the soul as its king, and the different senses and faculties as constituting an army. Reason may be called the vizier or prime minister, passion the revenue collector, and anger the police officer. 
under the guise of collecting revenue passion is continually prone to plunder on its own account while resentment is always inclined to harshness and extreme severity both of these the revenue collector and the police officer have to be kept in due subordination to the king but not killed or expelled as they have their own proper functions to fulfil but if passion and resentment master reason the ruin of the soul infallibly ensues a soul which allows its lower faculties to dominate the higher is as one who should hand over an angel to the power of a dog or a mussulman to the tyranny of an unbeliever the cultivation of demonic animal or angelic qualities results in the production of corresponding characters which in the day of judgment will be manifested in visible shapes the sensual appearing as swine the ferocious as dogs and wolves and the pure as angels the aim of moral discipline is to purify the heart from the rust of passion and resentment till like a clear mirror it reflects the light of god some one may here object but if man has been created with animal and demonic qualities as well as angelic how are we to know that the latter constitutes his real essence while the former are merely accidental and transitory to this i answer that the essence of each creature is to be sought in that which is highest in it and peculiar to it thus the horse and the ass are both burden-bearing animals but the superiority of the horse to the ass consists in its being adapted for use in battle if it fails in this it becomes degraded to the rank of burden-bearing animals similarly with man the highest faculty in him is reason which fits him for the contemplation of god if this predominates in him when he dies he leaves behind him all tendencies to passion and resentment and becomes capable of association with angels as regards his mere animal qualities man is inferior to many animals but reason makes him superior to them as it is written in the koran to man we have subjected all things in the earth but if his lower tendencies have triumphed after death he will ever be looking towards the earth and longing for earthly delights now the rational soul of man abounds in marvels boast of knowledge and power by means of it he masters arts and sciences can pass in a flash from earth to heaven and back again can map out the skies and measure the distances between the stars by it also he can draw the fish from the sea and the birds from the air and can subdue to his service animals like the elephant the camel and the horse his five senses are like five doors opening on the external world but more wonderful than this his heart has a window which opens on the unseen world of spirits in the state of sleep when the avenues of the senses are closed this window is opened and man receives impressions from the unseen world and sometimes foreshadowings of the future his heart is then like a mirror which reflects what is pictured in the tablet of fate but even in sleep thoughts of worldly things dull this mirror so that the impressions it receives are not clear after death however such thoughts vanish and things are seen in their naked reality and the saying in the koran is fulfilled we have stripped the veil from off thee and thy sight to-day is keen this opening of a window in the heart towards the unseen also takes place in conditions approaching those of prophetic inspiration when intuitions spring up in the mind unconveyed through any sense channel the more a man purifies himself from fleshly lusts and concentrates his mind on god the more conscious will he be of such intuitions those who are not conscious of them have no right to deny their reality nor are such intuitions confined only to those of prophetic rank just as iron by sufficient polishing can be made into a mirror so any mind by due discipline can be rendered receptive to such impressions it was at this truth the prophet hinted when he said every child is born with a predisposition towards islam then his parents make a jew or a christian or a star worshipper of him every human being has in the depths of his consciousness heard the question am i not your lord and answered yes to it 
but some hearts are like mirrors so befouled with rust and dirt that they give no clear reflections while those of the prophets and saints though they are men of like passions with us are extremely sensitive to all divine impressions nor is it only by reason of knowledge acquired and intuitive that the soul of man holds the first rank among created things but also by reason of power just as angels preside over the elements so does the soul rule the members of the body those souls which attain a special degree of power not only rule their body but those of others also if they wish a sick man to recover he recovers or a person in health to fall ill he becomes ill or if they will the presence of a person he comes to them according as the effects produced by these powerful souls are good or bad they are termed miracles or sorceries these souls differ from common folk in three ways one what others only see in dreams they see in their waking moments two while others wills only affect their own bodies these by will power can move bodies extraneous to themselves three the knowledge which others acquire by laborious learning comes to them by intuition these three of course are not the only marks which differentiate them from common people but the only ones that come within our cognizance just as no one knows the real nature of god but god himself so no one knows the real nature of a prophet but a prophet nor is this to be wondered at as in everyday matters we see that it is impossible to explain the charm of poetry to one whose ear is insusceptible to cadence and rhythm or the glories of color to one who is stone blind besides mere incapacity there are other hindrances to the attainment of spiritual truth one of these is externally acquired knowledge to use a figure the heart may be represented as a well and the five senses as five streams which are continually conveying water to it in order to find out the real contents of the heart these streams must be stopped for a time at any rate and the refuse they have brought with them must be cleared out of the well in other words if we are to arrive at spiritual truth we must put away for a time knowledge that has been acquired by external processes which too often hardens into dogmatic prejudice a mistake of an opposite kind is made by shallow people who echoing some phrases which they have caught from sufi teachers go about decrying all knowledge this is as if a person who was not an adept in alchemy were to go about saying alchemy is better than gold and were to refuse gold when it was offered to him alchemy is better than gold but real alchemists are very rare and so are real sufis he who has a mere smattering of sufism is not superior to a learned man any more than he who has tried a few experiments in alchemy has ground for despising a rich man any one who will look into the matter will see that happiness is necessarily linked with the knowledge of god each faculty of ours delights in that for which it was created lust delights in accomplishing desire anger in taking vengeance the eye in seeing beautiful objects and the ear in hearing harmonious sounds the highest function of the soul of man is the perception of truth in this accordingly it finds its special delight even in trifling matters such as learning chess this holds good and the higher the subject matter of the knowledge obtained the greater the delight a man would be pleased at being admitted into the confidence of a prime minister but how much more if the king makes an intimate of him and discloses state secrets to him an astronomer who by his knowledge can map the stars and describe their courses derives more pleasure from his knowledge than the chess player from his seeing then that nothing is higher than god how great must be the delight which springs from the true knowledge of him a person in whom the desire for this knowledge has disappeared is like one who has lost his appetite for healthy food or who prefers feeding on clay to eating bread all bodily appetites perish at death with the organs they use 
but the soul dies not and retains whatever knowledge of god it possesses nay increases it an important part of our knowledge of god arises from the study and contemplation of our own bodies which reveal to us the power of wisdom and love of the creator his power in that from a mere drop he has built up the wonderful frame of man his wisdom is revealed in its intricacies and the mutual adaptability of its parts and his love is shown by his not only supplying such organs as are absolutely necessary for existence as the liver the heart and the brain but those which are not absolutely necessary as the hand the foot the tongue and the eye to these he has added as ornaments the blackness of the hair the redness of lips, and the curve of the eyebrows. Man has been truly termed a microcosm, or little world in himself, and the structure of his body should be studied not only by those who wish to become doctors, but by those who wish to attain to a more intimate knowledge of God, just as close study of the niceties and shades of language in a great poem reveals to us more and more of the genius of its author but when all is said the knowledge of the soul plays a more important part in leading to the knowledge of god than the knowledge of our body and its functions the body may be compared to a steed and the soul to its rider the body was created for the soul the soul for the body if a man knows not his own soul which is the nearest thing to him what is the use of his claiming to know others it is as if a beggar who has not the wherewithal for a meal should claim to be able to feed a town in this chapter we have attempted in some degree to expound the greatness of man's soul he who neglects it and suffers its capacities to rust or to degenerate must necessarily be the loser in this world and the next the true greatness of man lies in his capacity for eternal progress otherwise in this temporal sphere he is the weakest of all things being subject to hunger thirst heat cold and sorrow those things he takes most delight in are often the most injurious to him and those things which benefit him are not to be obtained without toil and trouble as for his intellect a slight disarrangement of matter in his brain is sufficient to destroy or madden him as to his power the sting of a wasp is sufficient to rob him of ease and sleep as to his temper he is upset by the loss of a sixpence as to his beauty he is little more than nauseous matter covered with a fair skin without frequent washing he becomes utterly repulsive and disgraceful in truth man in this world is extremely weak and contemptible it is only in the next that he will be of value if by means of the alchemy of happiness he rises from the rank of beast to that of angels otherwise his condition will be worse than the brutes which perish and turn to dust it is necessary for him at the same time that he is conscious of his superiority as the climax of created things to learn to know also his helplessness as that too is one of the keys to the knowledge of god End of The Knowledge of Self From the Alchemy of Happiness by Al-Ghazali Chapter 1 Recorded by Craig Campbell in Appleton, Wisconsin in 2009 Contemplate the Beauty of God and are entirely free from animal qualities if thou art of angelic nature then strive toward thine origin that thou mayest know and contemplate the most high and be delivered from the thraldom to lust and anger thou shouldst also discover why thou hast been created with these two animal instincts whether that they should subdue and lead thee captive or whether thou shouldst subdue them and in thy upward progress make of one thy steed and of the other thy weapon the first step to self-knowledge is to know that thou art composed of an outward shape called the body and an inward entity called the heart or soul 
By heart, I do not mean the piece of flesh situated in the left of our bodies, but that which uses all the other faculties as its instruments and servants. In truth, it does not belong to the visible world, but to the invisible and has come into this world as a traveller visit thou eatest and when thou art angry thou attackest some one wilt thou progress any further in this path for the beasts are thy partners in this but real self-knowledge consists in knowing the following things what art thou in thyself and from whence hast thou come whither art thou going and for what purpose hast thou come to tarry here a while and in what does thy real happiness and misery consist? Some of thy attributes are those of animals, some of devils, some of angels, and thou hast to find out which of these attributes are accidental and which essential. Till thou knowest thou canst not find out where thy real happiness lies. The occupation of animals is eating, sleeping, and fighting. Therefore, if thou art an animal, busy thyself in these things. Devils are busy stirring up mischief, and in guile and deceit. If thou belongest to them, do their work. Angels come. The Knowledge of Self From the Alchemy of Happiness by Al-Ghazali Chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Knowledge of self is the key to the knowledge of God. According to the saying, He who knows himself knows God. And, as it is written in the Koran, We will show them our signs in the world and in themselves, that the truth may be manifest to them. Now nothing is nearer to thee than thyself, and if thou knowest not thyself, how canst thou know anything else? If thou sayest, I know myself, meaning thy outward shape, body, face, limbs, and so forth, such knowledge can never be a key to the knowledge of God, nor, if thy knowledge as to that which is within only extend so far, that when thou art hungry, it's a foreign country for the sake of merchandise, and will presently return to its native land. It is the knowledge of this entity and its attributes which is the key to the knowledge of God. Some idea of the reality of the heart or spirit may be obtained by a man closing his eyes and forgetting everything around except his individuality. He will thus also obtain a glimpse of the unending nature of that individuality. Too close inquiry, however, into the essence of spirit is forbidden by the law. In the Koran it is written, They will question thee concerning the Spirit. Say, The Spirit comes by the command of my Lord. Thus much is known of it, that it is an indivisible essence belonging to the world of decrees, and that it is not from everlasting, but created. An exact philosophical knowledge of the Spirit is not a necessary preliminary to walking in the path of religion but comes rather as a result of self-discipline and perseverance in that path, as it is said in the Koran, Those who strive in our way, verily we will guide them to the right paths. For the carrying on of this spiritual warfare by which the knowledge of oneself and of God is to be obtained, the body may be figured as a kingdom, the soul as its king, and the different senses and faculties as constituting an army. Reason may be called the vizier or prime minister, passion the revenue collector, and anger the police officer. Under the guise of collecting revenue, passion is continually prone to plunder on its own account, while resentment is always inclined to harshness and extreme severity. Both of these, the revenue collector and the police officer, have to be kept in due subordination to the king, but not killed or expelled, as they have their own proper functions to fulfill. But 